we have uh, John continue his mini course on translation services. Okay, so what I want to do, and so I've amended my goal for lecture three in view of lecture two, how lecture two work, work. And so what I want to do today is I want to recall the construction I was trying to describe for rotations, kind of going in the opposite direction. You imagine you're given the kind of final object you, you have, and you want to understand where it came from. And my hopes is that this will make the construction make a little more sense. Then I want to talk about the geometric interpretation of this, where rather than taking a z mod 2 z skew product over a rotation, what you're taking is two tori that are identical, glued along a slip. Okay. I want to talk about the space of these objects, um, which itself is a very nice SL2R invariant subset, closed SL2R invariant subset of uh, the space of translation surfaces in particular the stratum H11, which has two cone points each of um, angle 4 pi, cone angle 4 pi. Okay? So that was kind of what I was hoping to do last, uh, that ends sort of what I was hoping to do last time. And then from there I want to do a little bit of what I was planning to do on lecture three, which is to talk about a new, op the kind of the key operation that uh, Barack, John, and I worked with, which is the so-called tremor. Okay? And I want to define that for you guys. And I want to show that it commutes with the Horace cycle flow. Then in lecture four next time, I'll prove the fact that you can use these uh, examples to prove failure of genericity results, um, which is different phenomenon than you can see in homo for the Horace cycle flow in uh, homogeneous spaces. And I also want to then talk about new orbit closures for the Horace cycle flow and the moduli space of translation surfaces. So that's my amended plan for lectures three and four. Okay? Okay. So what I want to get started with is I want to try and recall what we did, uh, what I was getting towards last time, coming at it from the opposite direction, so starting at the end. So imagine I have a map, R hat, okay, uh, which will be a map of the 0, 1 interval cross z mod 2 z to itself. And let's imagine it's given in the following way that r hat of x comma i is equal to uh, r of x uh, comma i plus the characteristic function of some kind of interval called j of x, okay? where j is an interval. So there's a natural question I could ask myself with, um, uh, where j is an interval and r is rotation by alpha. Should I recall the definition of rotation by alpha, or does everybody remember it from last time? We're happy with it? Okay. Where r is rotation by alpha. So we can have a question, which is, is r hat uniquely ergodic? Oh, where r alpha is not rational. Mm -hmm. Is r hat uniquely ergodic? And there's a dichotomy. Either it's, uh, is it uniquely ergodic? And in my construction, the objects I produce will actually be minimal, but I'm going to sweep that under the rug for the purposes of my talks. So let's not worry about the issues of minimality. Okay? So we can ask our question itself, is r hat uniquely ergodic? And either it is or it has two invariant measures both of which are exchanged by plus one on the second coordinate, and both of which project to Lebesgue on the zero one interval. Okay, everybody happy about this? So is that a trivial statement? It should be clear to us? That yeah, this is just the fact that the group, the tr group translation on the right hand coordinate commutes with the rotation. So if you translate and then you do r hat, and you r hat and then you translate, those commute. So you can push an invariant measure by something that's commuting with the dynamics. Did that answer your question? It answered my question in the sense that either, if you have an ergodic measure, either it is, it, it is invariant under plus okay, one, yeah. or you get another ergodic one. So the fact like that you're, it, you're telling me that there are exactly two. But that's the fact that it should project to something, because this is a skew product, 
it should project to a, a, measure pres a preserved measure on the base, and the base rotation is uniquely yeah, valid. But, but why are there only two? Because each one projects to Lebesgue, and there's no space for extra. You have one that projects to Lebesgue, mm -hmm. And this I is two copies of, of uh, you, you, you understand all generic points up yeah. there. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So this is our question. And this question is hard. That's the point. This question is hard in general. And so I suggest to you guys a schematic for understanding this, which is that if you have special intervals, so we think of so a goal for attacking. or idea for attacking. Question. And what's the idea for attacking the question? We think of, uh, we think of there being intervals, I1 contained in I2, contained in I3, contained in da, 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 da. all contained in J, so that j is equal to the union of the i sub l's. And r hat sub k of x comma i being equal to uh, r of x comma i plus the characteristic function of i sub k evaluated x has, invariant, has an invariant set y sub k. We can find y sub k, right? And if the set when inf, so the union of the intersections of the y sub k has positive measure. The, the i sub l's are an infinite sequence. Yes, this is an infinite sequence of, of intervals. Increasing intervals. Of inter increasing intervals, and the union exhausts J. Mm -hmm. And you have these approximating objects <coughs> where you, for some reason, you can understand these Y sub Ks. And if it has positive measure, then um, the set lim inf is the support of an invariant measure. It is the support of an, or got an invariant measure. I should say carrying set of an invariant measure. So that's the goal. We have in general a question that's too hard. We have an idea of viewing it in a set, a sub. There are cases that we can understand because uh, kind of the the assumption in the logic here is that I actually can figure out what these y sub k's are, okay? I can figure out what these y sub k's are, and then I uh, figure out the question for the transformation I can't figure out as a limit of the situations I can figure out. So it's too hard to begin with. You think of these simpler objects, and you view your complicated object as a limit of the simpler ones. This is the dream of the approach I was suggesting. Is everyone happy with this? Okay. So now the whole point of what I was talking about before is to inductively understand these sets y sub k by understanding them in the first situation and then inductively understanding the set on which y sub k plus 1 is different than the set y sub k. So you understand what y sub k plus 1 is by understanding how it's different than y sub k. So you build y sub k plus 1 by just changing y sub k on an explicit set. That was the whole goal of that construction, okay? And for the logic of the statement, we had good control of the measure you changed it on. And if those were symbols, then this is going to have positive measure, and you'll get that your system is not uniquely ergodic. And it turns out that it's minimal too, but we're sweeping that under the rug. You had a question, Edward? Yes, for each k, r k is always, will be non-uniquely ergodic. Correct, but it actually won't be minimal yeah. in the examples we build. In the supports, uh, this y sub k will be a finite union of half-open intervals. 
in the construction we talked about. So it's something we can explicitly understand. It's something very, very nice. And in the limit, you'll get something that is dense. Okay. And okay. Did this kind of put it into a little bit better context? Okay, I'll now just say a brief word on what's going on with this construction because maybe um, it would help. So let's imagine I have an interval J tilde. Okay, and what do I want to make it? J tilde, I want to make it be the union, say from zero to R of Q sub J of zero. Um, Disjoint union, the interval from R of Q sub J of 0 to 0, no, to R sub 2 Q sub J. Are you sure you want the union of intersections and not the intersection of the unions? I want the set limb inf, and I think that's the union of intersections. So as this gets bigger, it's longer and longer along the way at which you get stuck. So, so you can wait longer and longer until you're stuck in all of the vice of case, and you're taking the union of that as, as this term. Yeah, so if this is m equals 1 to infinity, and this is k equals m to infinity. So for fixed k, it's the things that are in it for, for, fixed, for, for, for the fixed m here, you're in it for all k's bigger than or equal to m. So this is now your big for all large enough, the set limit. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Great, thank you for the question. Okay, um, all right, so we're considering this set y sub uh, uh, j tilde, okay? So now if I consider, let's say, r tilde of x comma i to be equal to um, r of x comma i plus the characteristic function of j tilde of x, right. uh, I think here I'm going to assume that my Second term in my continued fraction expansion is at least 2. So it's a very mild assumption. So if this is my r tilde of x, uh, then r tilde has two ergodic measures. I'm going to suggestively name the first interval in this disjoint union a tilde. Kind of recall notation from yesterday um, has two ergodic measures, one supported on um, uh, zero comma one minus the union from L equals one to uh, Q sub J of R <coughs> Q not A R of R to the L of a tilde cross 0. And I need to take this and I need to union it with what I've missed from the, pro so this better projectile obey. So I now need to take this union, what I removed out. So it's also, I take the union from L equals 1 to Q sub J of R to the L of a tilde cross 1. That's the support of one measure. And the support of the other measure is this is a 1 and this is a 0. Okay. So I can figure out one step in this construction. So for example, if i1 was equal to j tilde, I could figure out what y1 ought to be. And it's going to be a finite union of intervals. Is everyone OK with this? Yes. So, so for this, like you have two disjoint regarding measures, here's where you need like the disjointness of the forward iterates, or this doesn't use that at all? This uses the disjointness of the forward iterates, because otherwise this description breaks down. That, that, that the way you kind of understood these things breaks down. All right. So now we're in a nice situation. Oh, give me one second to think. Um, yeah. Okay. But this is also the only idea in the entire construction, because this is also how things work inductively. So imagine I gave you the interval i sub k. So Imagine we have i sub k had i sub k and i sub k plus 1 is equal to i sub k disjoint union um, j tilde. So this is the assumption that this is an interval 
and that J tilde is disjoint from the I sub K you had. Yes, thank you. Yes. So I might be well, but are you sure you want the intervals to be nested? Because the limit seems like it's just J. The y sub k's are the invari are the invariant sets for the r sub k. Y, so these are going to be unions of image. These are going to be complicated descriptions. Uh, yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I thought that was an I. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Thank you for that question. Okay. So this. Okay. So imagine we have this. Then y sub k plus one. Um, is equal to y sub k on um, 0, 1 minus the union from L equals 1 to Q sub j of R to the L of A tilde. And it's flipped on the complement. Meaning you flip the fibers on the complement. So this one idea doesn't just give you the starting case, it also gives you how to inductively build these sets. OK, so who's with me at this point? Oh, OK, we've done much better. <laughs> um, but there's still a lot of people aren't with me. If somebody has a question to ask at this point, I'd be happy. Yes? So why do we actually need this jointness of the iterates of uh, A till then? Yeah, so imagine, the, imagine I wanted to take the third image, and the first image had non-trivial intersection with itself. Yeah. There'd be points that would flip fiber, and then immediately flip back. And so then when you hit the third image, it would be a little more complicated what was going on. <laughs> So we need these journeys with the first, but why would we need these journeys along each other, like tech, second and third, for example? We don't flip after. But, 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 but you would get intermediate flips. The idea is you want to control all the times you flip, and disjointness lets you know exactly when you flip back. Did that answer your question? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, thanks for that question. Okay, so this is a... Okay. All right, does anyone else have other questions? OK, now from the theory of continued fractions, you can very well control the measure of this set. And in particular, by making that summable, you can ensure that this has positive measure, okay? and then Bob's your uncle. And in the limit, you get some kind of more complicated set that's a set limit inf of finite unions of half open intervals. Um, and that's what your set is, it's the set limit inf of a sequence of finite unions of half open intervals. And so it's not the all, most awful type of set. You can kind of explicitly describe what's going on. You can explicitly understand generic points. Um, and this is part of why this is such a good construction, because you can really do a ton with it and figure out what is going on. Is everyone happy with this? All right, so I just want to briefly kind of view the picture here, so schematically, you can think of the J S sub i's as being the symmetric difference of i sub, uh, the J sub k's as being the symmetric difference of i sub k and i sub k minus 1, right? And you view your interval as being a union of little pieces that are the piece you're pushing it out, and each of those are split into two pieces, right? And in the schematic, the, J t the A tilde would be, say, J tilde prime, and this would, say, be J tilde double prime. And that's the way you view your intervals and you understand this much more hard-to-understand object in this way. Okay. Are there any questions with this? Yes? So the, the supports you get in the end, those cannot be, like, they're not invariant under... This is an invariant set under the limiting dynamics. Okay, but it could be a zero measure invariant set, but assuming it has positive measure, it will be um, an invariant set of definite measure that will uh, be a supportive inter invariant measure. Yeah, but I mean, it's not closed, because like, I mean, you're trying to get, you're trying it's to get- It's not topologically closed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not topologically closed, but it is invariant under the dynamics. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, the word supports the wrong word, I should say, carrying set. Okay. So now, 
Um, the whole point is that this is a geometric object. So in particular, um, the first return of the flow on a torus to one of its sides gives you the <coughs> rotation. Okay? And so this skew product over a rotation that we're building here could be thought of as a skew product, or it should be, could be thought of as the first return map of the skew product over a flow. And I've got a picture to suggest this. So we've got kind of a funky um, surface here, which is two tori glued along a slit. Uh, I hope that red and blue are clearer for you guys to see apart than they are for me close to the board. Can people see this? So this is blue and this is blue. And this is red and this is red. And this side's identified with this side. 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 But this blue is identified with this blue, and this red is identified with this red. I've marked you the two cone points. Um, all of the asterisk points are identified. All of the circle points are identified. And you can easily compute that the cone angle of both of these is 4 pi. So this is a picture of a translation surface. You can think of this as being two, tor two identical tori glued along a slit. In what sense? If I remove all of the red and the blue, I disconnect these two tori. I no longer have a connected translation surface. I have a disconnected one with boundary components. Everyone happy about this? And this is what I mean by two tori glued, two identical tori glued along a slit. Are people happy about that? Let me just quickly skip down a little bit further. Here's another picture of two identical tori glued along a slit, slightly different. The blue side's identified with the blue side, the red's identified with red. This is this, this is this, this is this, this is this. That's another picture. There's lots of different pictures you can draw of this, which are helpful for their own reasons. And you can consider now the vertical flow on this object. And I'm drawing you its trajectory and dotted lines here. So when you come out this side here, you get identified over here, you come up over here. Now next, we're going to come out over here on the bottom. You go up to the top, and then you keep going. And the fact is that the first return map to the base is going to be a map of this form. Is everyone OK with that? OK, because what's going on here, you project to being the tor, you project to being rotation. If you forget about which side you're on, and you just record what you do on the original torus to that, you get a rotation. And you're dancing between these when you land in some particular interval. Who's with me at this point? OK? Um, a lot of people not raising their hands. Maybe people don't like to raise hands. But maybe somebody has a question. Okay. Yeah, so maybe I'll write this in words. Just, just to make sure, John, uh, yeah. we have a projection from, the, uh, from this translation service to the two torus, uh, which commutes with the. So I can. I can I, if I take these two pictures and completely identify them to get one torus, mm -hmm. this would be a factor map? Yeah, yeah, okay. perfectly, yeah. exactly. And, this and the first return map of this factor map to one of its sides will be a rotation. Mm -hmm. So I might be confusing people because I'm using dynamics, dynamics lingo here. Um, so I hope I'm not confusing people. Um, OK, so what's the idea? The idea is if I started with my original torus here, and I looked at the first return map of the vertical flow to the side, let's say this over here is alpha, and this length is equal to 1. The first return map to the side <coughs> is rotation by alpha. Everyone happy with that? Right, when you go up, you've moved over by alpha, you follow your identification, it's rotation by alpha. That's all that's happening. Okay? And in this picture I'm showing you, you're moving, there's a particular interval when, when you hit it, you're going to move between the two copies. Okay? And in this way, you're going to see that you're rotating, that the first return map to the union of the two horizontal sides in the picture we had is going to give us. Uh, a map like our hat. Okay. Okay. So if you so what we are looking at is a is a suspension of the of our hat of our hat. Yes. Okay. Of 
I, I hope that makes sense to people. Um, okay. Now, you can iterate the procedure we talked about beforehand, um, and you can view a series of approximating slits that you can disconnect. Um, and there you can understand what the invariant measures are. And then you can write, uh, understand the invariant measure for the flow. But there's actually a better way to do it. So this is the one moment in the talk, uh, or one of the two places in my mini course, where renormalization dynamics will raise its uh, beautiful slash ugly head. Um, but there's a much better way to kind of think about this in terms of the renormalization picture. Okay? So what's the idea? The idea is the following. Imagine I'm gluing two tori. So let's consider the torus. So consider the torus. Torus. Uh, one minus alpha zero one times the square torus. Okay. So this is a perfectly nice torus. Um, you should probably try to lift the board as far as, you, as high as you can. Oh, thanks. Yeah, thank you. So consider the torus 1 minus alpha 0, 1. The first return map to the horizontal side is going to give you rotation by alpha. Okay? So now glue two copies. Along a slit. summation uh, of uh, 2 times the distance of R of Q sub uh, K sub J of Y comma to Y, where you're assuming the parity of the K sub J's are all even, the K sub J's are all even, and all of the A sub K sub J plus 1's are at least 5, say. Is everyone okay with this? And this is a uh, genus 2 surface. And in fact, this is a surface just like the one I drew for you guys, just like the one we had pictured earlier. Is everybody OK with this? Okay. Let's make the observation that a vertical trajectory from 0, where does a vertical trajectory from 0 trajectory and we're asking ourselves where this lands. Um, and where it lands is it lands exactly at um, the summation. So it lands um, at the summation of two distance of R Q K sub L of zero comma zero. Okay. And this is from L equals 1 to R to the right of 0. Okay. So in particular, along this infinite slit, slit where, of where I'm summing from J to infinity, it lands R, the sum up to R of the way along the end. Okay. So the horizontal distance from the slit so the horizontal distance, horizontal distance 
from the other endpoint of the slit. summation from j equals r plus 1, where this r is the same as this r, to infinity of 2 times the distance of r to the q uh, k sub j of 0 comma 0. Okay. And this is going to be proportional to a sub r plus 1, I'm sorry, a sub k sub r plus 1 plus 1 uh, times q sub k sub r plus 1 inverse. Is everybody okay with this? Can you explain what, what is y? Why is any point where uh, it the, the distance between the iterates is the same and independent? So it just it doesn't matter. Well, you, you could do it for zero. Z zero, like, x, whatever. Yeah. Zero, zero. One half. Yeah. Just uh, It doesn't matter where I put the slit, right? Because no, it doesn't. It's homogeneous space. Yes. The torus is a homogeneous space. Once you introduce the slit, no longer. But before yeah. you introduce the slit. Okay. So this is the horizontal distance. Um, okay. And so what's the point? The point is that under renormalization dynamics, if I renormalize my flow, if I can track the vertical by um, q sub k sub r plus 1, and I expand the horizontal by q sub k sub r plus 1, okay, then this is going to be proportional to a sub k sub r plus 1 plus 1 inverse. And if this number is big, this is going to be a tiny slip. Moreover, this is something of size like q sub k sub r. The vertical length is proportional to q sub k sub r. So the vertical component can be very, very small. So what you have is an almost horizontal slit, okay, with a very small vertical, I'm sorry, an almost horizontal slit, and moreover, the horizontal component is very small. Is everybody okay with this? You can remove this slit. And consider your, your space as being now two disjoint tori, tori. You can put the big on one, and you can pull it back to your original set. And this will be kind of an approximation of your eventual ergodic measure in this construction. So geometrically, you can run the exact same discussion we talked about beforehand, where you're identifying kind of approximating invariant sets of the limiting transformation, and you want to view your eventual ergodic measure as living on the set limit of these approximating objects. And geometrically, they're just one of the two copies of the tori you get after applying renormalization dynamics. Okay. So th these are very concrete objects that can be understood very well. And so once again, you can look at successive pairs of these tori. You can ask yourself if a particular example gives you something non-uniquely ergodic, and you can look at successive um, copies of these tori, and you can ask whether the transfer of mass is summable. And so there's a picture uh, that's kind of suggestive of this here. You can imagine you've applied renormalization dynamics for a long time. You get a slit like that. Your previous invariant set was, say, all on the top half, and now at the next stage, your invariant set will be what's in red. And your other invariant set will be what's in white. But you can understand pretty well how they're different. And then the question is whether, and the summability condition will then be the amount of red on this torus that's at each stage. And you're just going to sum that over the infinitely many decompositions. And if that converges, you'll have an invariant set. And moreover, you'll understand it's a weak star limit of um, measures supported on geometrically nice objects. Is everybody happy about this? Okay, so now just very briefly, um, the space of these objects is a six real dimensional space, two, two identical tori glued along the slit. You have four dimensions from choosing your torus, and once you choose one, you choose the other because they're identical, and then you have two real dimensions for choosing the slit. 
if you restrict yourself to the area one locus, which we're doing throughout this, it's a five real dimensional locus. Okay? You can think of this as being related to the space of tori with two marked points. Um, and in fact, it's a degree four cover of this space. And you can also think of this as being SL2R, semi-direct R2, modulo SL2Z, semi-direct Z2. There's some caveats here, because depending on whether you want to let the, depending on whether you want the, uh, to let the singularities co co coincide slash the marked points of the torus coincide. But the point is that this is very close to being a homogeneous space. Depending on how you think of it, it is. Um, and um, so this is another advantage to this construction that I talked about. The geometric interpretation has very good methods of understanding it by viewing it in one of these two ways, as either the space of a torus with two mark points or um, uh, the affine group of the plane. Okay, people happy with this? Okay, so I, this example is a little complicated, but I think it actually, in terms of the kind of tools you can bring to bear on it, it's not so bad. Maybe it should have three lectures to explain it rather than one and a half, but uh, part of what I'm doing here is an advertisement for this example that I love and have found very useful. All right, so we're now moving on from this example. Is everybody okay with this? Okay, great. So now what I want to do in the remaining 20 minutes of my talk is talk about tremors. All right, so the setup of what I'm talking about now is we have is to recall two objects from what we did last time. And I'm going to do some kind of a Baroque version of this. So recall two objects from last time. And what are those two objects? They're the um, fact that we have local coordinates on the space of translation surfaces, which are given by you choose a nice polygonal representation of your surface and then with paired sides, and then you look at the vectors of the paired sides, right? And that gives you local coordinates for your space. These are called period coordinates. People okay with that? Um, and then there's an SL2R action, and one thing I forgot to do on my first talk is to describe what the SL2R action looks like in these coordinates. It's completely trivial. It's just the diagonal action of SL2R on these sides. Okay, what do I mean by that? Um, imagine I have a polygon. Um, So U sub S, recall, is the matrix 
1, S, 0, 1. All right. And let's look at the coordinates of uh, U, S, M. Okay. And this is now going to be, um, so it's going to be H of gamma 1 plus S of the times the vertical of gamma 1. Okay. Uh, times the vertical of gamma 1, or the second coordinate will be the vertical of gamma 1. Is everybody happy with that first coordinate? I've really done nothing. Can I see more heads nodding, or do people have questions? Okay, great. All right, so hopefully there's no questions. Okay, and then let's leave the world of Tori and actually have something more complicated here. So this is going to be h of gamma k plus s of v gamma k. V of gamma k. And that will be the coordinates of the image under the Hori cycle plot. Okay. So I want to now describe a variant of the Hori cycle flow that you can do when you have an invariant measure that's absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue. This is a special case of what we do with, uh, in, our, in my work with Barack and John. You can really do it for any um, in, invariant measure that gives zero mass to any horizontal segment. Uh, um, and you can even treat the case of so-called atomic tremors. Um, in order, probably the natural setting, to, for those who know about uh, transverse invariant measures, that's the natural setting to talk about this. I'm not assuming the audience knows about that, so I'm doing kind of an ad hoc description of our process. And in that ad hoc description, it helps me to consider absolutely continuous invariant measures. Everybody happy with that? So with absolutely continuous invariant measure for the whole cycle flow or oh, the no, modulized No, uh, yeah, so let me get, uh, let me now talk about, uh, be, be more um, explicit. So assume. Can you lift the board? Oh, thank you. Assume the horizontal flow on M. Um, let's call this F to the T sub M. Uh, has an absolutely continuous, where absolutely continuous means with respect to Lebesgue, uh, invariant measure. Yeah. So M, M here denotes a single, uh, uh, what is it? M? M is a single. And then there's a translation surface? surface. Yeah. So the flow is not on M, the flow is on, on the modelized space of M. No. Uh, no? Each translation surface has a ah, uh, ah. translation flow I in see. every direction. Okay, so when you say flow, you don't mean US. US acts on the modulized Yeah, flow. so FT of M is the notation for the horizontal flow on M. On a fixed M. On okay. a fixed M, yeah. Thank you for that question. So this is a common cause of confusion in this setting, because you have two objects going on, and the part of the beauty of this subject is the interplay. So they're going to both be going on at the same time, and you have to keep track of where you're living. So thank you for that question. And if people are confused of where I am at any point, please feel free to ask, because probably you're not the only confused person. Okay? And thanks for that question. So assume it has an absolutely continuous invariant measure mu. And so I want to define the coordinates of some kind of, so what's the idea behind this? The idea behind this is the horror cycle flow sees the Lebesgue measure on M. Right, you're looking at the vertical component when you're looking at M with respect to Lebesgue measure. But if I have a different invariant measure, why should Lebesgue be privileged? Right? That's ridiculous. I should be able to do a horror cycle flow with, with respect to any invariant measure I want. Okay? Did that make sense to anybody? Okay. So now let me just mention this variant won't be uh, defined globally. It's not going to be, a, but what it's going to define is it's going to define trajectories at some points. Not at every point, it's going to be, but from one point you'll get an embedded copy of the reals <coughs> in the setting that we're talking about here. So I want to, the coordinates of an object that I will call trend of m comma mu of s to be equal to So John, to make mm -hmm. sure I understand, you assume something about the single M and then you assume that 
a single M has this uh, uh, absolutely continuous. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a big assumption on M. In almost every translation surface, the only interesting version of this will be the Horus cycle. But there's a measure zero set where you can actually do something interesting. And that's what our examples are built from. Did that answer your question? OK. So now, the measure mu, so there exists a, Bo a Borel set. U, foliated by horizontal lines. So that um, the measure of U, um, so that mu lives on, is carried on U. And um, the complement of mu in the writing Lebeg gives zero mass to, to U also. So U belongs to U. So in particular, you could think of U as being the set to tie this into the lectures we've seen. U could be the generic points for mu under the horizontal flow, assuming this is ergodic. Okay. People OK with this? Um, uh, let's see. Uh, let's actually change this to be ergodic invariant measure mu. Okay, so what are the coordinates going to be? The coordinates are going to be uh, h of gamma 1 plus now I'm going to do something funky here. I'm going to do s times the integral of the characteristic function of the set u, the special set u. John, just uh, I think I'm completely lost because uh, the Lebesgue measure without a density is always invariant. <coughs> Right? Yes, yeah, so I want this to be horizontal. The horizontal flow. So I want this to be your ergodic measure. And I want it to be absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue. But how could to, to uh... So we've just how, how could it be that uh, that uh, Lebesgue will be invariant and then another So in the hopefully I've motivated the fact that you can build two horizontal, uh, two identical tori glued along a slit, where the flow still leaves Lebesgue invariant, oh, okay. but there's yeah. going to be two ergodic so measures, both of which right. have half the measure of the Lebesgue measure right. of the entire space. They're interchanged by this involution. They project onto the torus to be the whole torus, right? So, so roughly, Lebesgue decomposes into finitely many uh, points. Yeah, components. perfect. Yeah. And we should imagine you to be one of those two. Yes, yes, one of those two. Mu is one of those two. Thanks, Martin. Okay. So in, in my second coordinate, I want this to still be V of gamma 1. Okay. And that's going to be what this it happens in all of the coordinates. So the horizontal component of gamma k plus s times the integral over gamma k of characteristic function of u dy comma V of gamma k. Now, the condition that I'm foliated on horizontal lines is very helpful. Because sets of full measure, you can change on sets of zero measure, and they don't change at all. And what I'm looking at is something zero measure in a two-dimensional space. But because I'm foliated by horizontal lines, this is really a one-dimensional object. And so this is supposed to capture the idea of a transverse invariant measure. Uh, for those of you who are aware here, I could just as well do that. Is everyone OK with this? What have you just defined here? I mean, yeah. Are you defining tram or is this? Uh, this is the coordinates of the tram Okay. And so what? W what is this object tram Is is this? Yeah. Uh, you get an M and you get mu mm -hmm. and what does it yeah. split up? Thank you. So tram map. So I want to. So the goal. Define a new translation surface. Describe it in local coordinates first. People okay with this? 
Uh, yeah. Uh, can you say in the previous example of two tori that I put along this list, what is uh, you exactly? What is mu? You, 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 the Borel set. The oh, the Borel set? It's going to be the limit of, uh, so you take your tori, you imagine you can do this iterative construction over and over again, where you perform geodesic flow and you renormalize, yeah. and now you get tori that are glued, reasonable tori that are glued along microscopic horizontal slits. You remove that and you look at one of the copies of tori you have left. And you take the set limit of that sequence of tori now in this space, and that's going to be your set u. So in that picture you showed where there were kind of like uh, denser uh, mm -hmm. regions of, of the flow and the, yeah. and the less dense. In, in that terms, can you say uh, something about u? Yeah. So, you're, so the idea is when you looked at the top and the bottom tori, yeah. that's a bad approximation of u. And, but looking at the red set and the white set is a better approximation of you. And as you repeat this over and over, you'll keep getting better and better ones. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. In general, though, abstractly, you could think of as you as the generic points for um, your invariant measure. Okay. And yes? If, if, if you take you being the whole surface, it also satisfies that you wrote this. And you get a horror cycle flow. And it carries. Hmm? You get a horror cycle flow. So for, for every U and for so every you you the world you sense. get a map from the real no, no, Yeah, so what, what I mean, oh, I think when someone's re referring to this carried on U, I also want the, um, so, so the bay can be written as the part that's on U um, plus the part that's singular with respect to mu. But I also want the singular part to give U measure the zero. Okay, if that would answer your question? So, so the bag has two, let's say, it's, it's two, com uh, two ergodic components, and you're taking one of them, and it's supported on you. Yeah, so, so okay, the random Nikodem derivative of, um, the characteristic of, of mu you. with respect to Lebeg, and it has two values. It's one and zero value. Lebeg, almost everywhere, it takes one of two values, one and zero. So. And I want the set where it's zero to intersect z u in a null set. Oh, did that answer your question, Vincent? Okay. Um, all right, so this is the coordinates <coughs> of what I want to talk about. And you can also think of geometrically what's going on is you're moving the sides you're describing, but you're moving them according to this coordinate change. So it's a little hard to picture what's going on, but we can do it only in a very, tri we can do it in a very trivial case. Right. And so, what's the trivial case of the tori? So what do I have? I've got a, two copies of tori glued along the horizontal slits. And I'm considering the horizontal flow. So each of these tori is going to be invariant for the horizontal flow. Okay? So I can tr choose my set u to be one of these tori. Okay. Is everybody happy with that? And then what I do is I do horror cycle flow to one of these tori and leave the other tori unchanged. Kind of okay with this? Mm -hmm. All right, so that's the idea. Um, and moreover, this is essentially the general picture. Because what you can do is you can find nearby translation surfaces where your invariant measure is a pro where the horizontal flow is not minimal and it splits into two components like this, but possibly by very complicated horizontal line segments. You can put Lebesgue measure on one of those, and those are converging to what your tremor is actually doing in this special case. Okay? So this is a simple, the simple case and the only one I can really draw a picture of. But it also sort of, in the limit, this gives you the general picture. Are you okay with this? So what you do is you do a horror cycle flow, but you restrict your, you restrict your measurements to where one measure lives. And that's the idea behind it. Okay, um, so now I just want to mention one key property about this, which is that the tremor map commutes with the horror cycle flow. So 
So did I get it correctly that you just you, you basically cut your your translation surface along horizontal lines to some strips, mm -hmm. and then on some of them you act with the with you with the oropharyngeal flow. Mm -hmm. On the rest you don't do nothing. Correct. But, and since the oropharyngeal flow do not uh, change length does not change the length of horizontal segments, you can re-glue the new picture yeah. to get a new Perfect. Set. That is a perfect yeah. description, but there's something else going on with your statement that um, the, har the horizontal line segments aren't changed, the horizontal flow doesn't change the horizontal line segments. This also tells you that this gives you a topological conjugacy of uh, the horizontal flows between these two surfaces. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, okay, so in coordinates, Uh, the heart tremor and uh, trem and uf and the horse cycle flow commute where they're defined. Right, tremor is not defined anywhere, but where it is defined, it commutes with the horse cycle flow. And what's the statement? The statement is just the commutivity of addition. Right? Doesn't matter if I do this here. However, there's a little bit hiding here, which goes back to my uh, response a moment ago to, to, to Uri, which is that the tremor is defined with respect to an invariant measure. So if I'm doing the tremor not at m mu, but at u sub t of m, I need to have the right thing to put in here in place of u. Right? But, but it's not really with respect to mu, it's with respect to a set u that you choose. It doesn't, you do, but by our choice that u is foliated by horizontal lines, only and that one. we're absolutely continuous, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. so long as the set on which the Radom-Nikodim derivative of mu with respect to Lebesgue is zero intersects u in a zero set. Did that answer your question? So by making it be foliated on horizontal lines, you're removing kind of the dependence on the set u. And once again, the words I should be saying are transverse invariant measures. So mu should give you a so-called transverse invariant measure, and you should be uh, looking at this. Or alternately, you should have a cohomology class associated to mu, and you should be evaluating your simple closed pairs on this cohomology class. OK, but in any case. Um, all right, so you compute in coordinates, but that's not, but you don't necessarily know how to get these coordinates. But the point is that because the horror cycle flow is a um, conjugacy of the dynamics of the horizontal flow. You can identify the simplex of invariant measures for the horizontal flow on M with the horror cycle image of M. Okay? And in this way, in coordinates, trend of mu s can mute. And in fact, uh, let's do it this way. U S two of uh, trem of m comma mu, uh, say S one, is equal to trem of U S two of m comma the U S two push forward of mu. I do this for S1 amount of time, where this means the homeomorphism between the translation surfaces M and US2 of M that are induced by the map US2. Right? It was something I brought up in my first lecture, the fact that these elements of SL2R actually give you, they don't just change your translation surface, but they give you a homeomorphism between the two of them. Okay? And this is the commutivity relation. Well, thanks for your time. Questions? Yeah? So in these, like, going back to the construction you did with, like, this story and with this well-chosen slip, mm -hmm. so that you, like, you looked at it as a limit of this mm -hmm. for example. So in that case, like that gives you a measure which you can tremor. But I presume like it's hard to separate the limiting cases like two tori and then just for like one of them or because like you said, like this is the yeah. picture that I can draw, but 
So I'm going to take three minutes to answer this question. Um, I said in words this, and I think it was ha hard to follow in words. So imagine. But you, you should bring up the board because no one can. Oh, thank you. It's going to take time to say it. Like people should be able to read it. So imagine the horizontal flow. Let's say f to the t of m uh, infinity is minimal and not nuclear guy. Okay. The way I want it, where this is two identical tori glued along a slit. The way I wanted to understand the slit is as a successive nested union of slits I can actually understand. So the and there exists M1, comma dot 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 dot. Um, so that uh, the M sub i are converging in the space of tori to M infinity. Okay. Ft to the M i. Um, is not uniquely ergodic, but not minimal, and not minimal. So I started with something minimal, but I'm building something that's not minimal. This is a lot like our cases of the R hats and the R hats of Ks, because the Y sub Ks are not debts, right? They're finite unions of intervals. People okay with this? Uh, and the invariant measures Uh, let's replace the very by ergodic measures of uh, f to the t of m sub i are converging to the ergodic measure of f to the t of m infinity. Now, these are different translation surfaces, so I want to compare measures on nearby translation surfaces. Let me just say that there's many different ways of doing this. Pick your favorite one. Maybe you don't know of any. I can tell you guys after the talk if you're interested. But there's a way of comparing these objects to each other. Then what we have is we've got that the trim of um, uh, ergodic measures of f sub t sub i, let's call these mu sub i, are converting to the ergodic measure here mu sub infinity. Then what we have is we've got the tr tremor of m infinity with respect to mu infinity for time s is equal to the limit of the tremor of the m sub i with respect to mu sub i of time s. So in this way, if you can write your measure as a limit of approximating guys that are not minimal, the picture, the only picture we can understand can actually in the limit tell you what, the, what you're getting. And of course, we're in a metric space, so the word limit makes sense. Right? This, is, this limit is happening in the space of translation surfaces. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Yes. Either, either. I just have an other So in then that picture where you had, you know, you're making that limit where mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. utilize striping further. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the limit then, the, these integrals integral along gamma i mm -hmm. u um, dy are these about like one half of the vertical of gamma i or like what are these? That's the point. It's going to be asymmetrically distributed. Yeah, okay. So yeah. in particular, if you imagine the original sides of your two tori, one of them is going to get some amount, and the other one is going to get the complement of that. So one of them might have to be very close to what Lebesgue would have given. But that means the other one's going to be very sm small compared to it. And so what you're doing is you're doing kind of horror cycle at different rates on these two identified pieces, and they average out to be in what the horror cycle flow would give you, but one of them is going faster and one's going slower. Did that answer your question? Yes. And Martin? Um, I'm envisioning a programming exercise for somebody who wants to do more of that and just see if my picture is correct. So we could approximate the limiting case mm -hmm. of your measure mm -hmm. by by the approximation process you've been talk, uh, telling us last uh, lecture and in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And for each finite approximation of that limiting thing, I could sort of um, program the exact thing. I could start with a torus and I could push a button, draw me for a time s equals zero to mm -hmm. whatever, mm -hmm. a bit, and let, let the two tori flow. Step zero would be 
Um, you start with two identical ones and you get the trivial picture that was mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. um, blackboard yep. um, where only one torus mm -hmm. is being moved and the other one stands yep. where it yep. was. Step one for the first approximation, both of them are somehow moved a bit and because one of them picks, I mean, the first approximation of the iterative process mm -hmm. that approximates and then the second and then I, I, I draw, and then I make the next movie with a, with a second approximation, mm -hmm. and the next movie with a third approximation, and so forth. Yeah. That should be doable. I mean, presumably. Presumably. I mean, it's it's completely calculatable. It's a yeah. it's a finite yeah. process. You can you can yeah. plug it into a computer program. What are we going to see at the at the tenth step? The tenth step is being visually already. Yeah. Uh, pretty close to infinity. Yeah, so <laughs> let me say, if you look at one of your original sides, so I was talking about the coordinates, which is the total displacement from one singularity to the other singularity. That's kind of a nice description. But along the way, it's going to be changed by different amounts, depending on where the measures are concentrated. And so what you're going to see is smaller and smaller lines. So if you can play, say, the first step to the, uh, let's say, the third step to the tenth step, what you're going to see in both of them is there's going to be little pieces where you're moved at constant rate. And it's going to change depending on the pieces that you're at. Right? Pieces will either be moved or not moved at all, <coughs> okay? depending on your approximating invariant set. So it's going to break up into horizontal yeah. strips. And so there'll be pieces that are moved and not moved. And as you repeat it more and more, those pieces are going to get tinier and tinier. But if you compare the strip that you had before to the other strip, you'll see a strip that got moved a lot. What's going to happen is it's going to have a lot of pieces. Most of its length will be tiny pieces that are moved. It's going to have some pieces that aren't moved in it, but it will be very small density of the entire thing. I don't know if I answered your question, but I tried yeah, you, to. you sort of did. You should find a gratitude to maybe there's one around to actually program that for, for you. <laughs> for us, let me and just, I mean, this would be nice. Okay, maybe we are eight minutes uh, uh, over time, so maybe we, we continue the discussion outside. Thank you, John, again.